Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Cole Kushner. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to, to The Break, Break It, it Down, Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. The great music of Dmitry Shostakovich. You gave historical perspective. You talked about his relationship as a Russian to the people around him and to the government of the USSR. Then you had pieces of music that were introduced in your lecture and then played in full. And that was a spectacular experience on a Saturday morning. And my observation was, first of all, that the Herbs Theater, how many people is that? That theater hall. I think 1100, 1100, including the balcony. Yeah, Pete and I were talking about how <clears throat> yeah. it was right there in the, at the thousand mark somewhere. But these people came out to a cultural event at the Opera House at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And that's kind of odd. I'll tell you, it worked out beautifully for Boy. myself and my wife. Number one, because we drove straight fucking there without a moment of traffic. <laughs> we had time to grab a nice cappuccino ahead of time and warm into the experience and then enjoy the experience to its fullest and we were in the city for lunch on a Saturday. So it's really brilliant timing. But you don't think about Saturday at 10 a.m. as a time to get cultured this way. And since one of the four of us has most recently had this experience of figuring out how to obtain some patronage for this capturing of an art, I want to talk about that. First of all, Dr. Bob, how in the hell do you get that thing funded? Something like that is funded like, like all of the programs. This is uh, the organization that runs this program is San Francisco Performances. And the organization is about 35 years old. It was founded by a brilliant woman named Ruth Felt. And the way she funded it initially and continued to fund it until she retired three years ago is uh, to cultivate a very wealthy board of directors, cultivate all the big money that's here in town. And luckily, San Francisco has a lot of big money and a, and a good degree of philanthropy. It's not like, God bless us, it's not like Dallas, for example, where the philanthropy is just unfreaking believable. But there's a, there's a lot of old money in San Francisco. So it means cultivating individuals, creating a very effective board of directors that can then also cultivate their friends. So it comes from private donations, is what it comes from. Wow. There are some grantors out there. I mean, there's, you know, there's the Hewlett Foundation and, and there's the California State Arts Foundation. There used to be the National Endowment of the Arts, although that's been savaged, unfortunately. But for the most part, this is private money that keeps an organization like this alive, a nonprofit organization like this alive. So what she would have done when we created this program back in 92 is she would have talked to her board and said, listen, we want to start a new program on Saturday mornings. Experiment. People can come in their street clothes. It'll combine talk and performance. It was me and the Alexander String Quartet, who you heard perform yesterday. Brilliantly. A brilliant group. I mean, yeah. first class, first. And I've been, I, as I've said before, we've been, we've been working together since the 80s because I've been composing for them. I've composed four string quartets for them and a piano quintet and, uh, and a bevy of other pieces. So it's a long-term, very long-term relationship. Anyway, Ruth would have said to her board, I want to do this. I want to experiment and see if we can do an off-hours program where people can just come in in their street clothes and get a little talk and a little music. And uh, she would have said, I'm budgeting $40,000 this season for it. Uh, who, who's who's going who's gonna to deliver? Anybody? 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 Raise your hands. <laughs> and who do you know who's going to deliver for this? That's what she would have done. Yesterday afterwards, the reason why I couldn't join you afterwards, as you know, is because uh, we had a, a little a, affair with the, with the donors, with about 40 people, mm -hmm. who are the people that are currently supporting the program. Right. And they all deserve a little thank you and a, and a, little, a little flesh. Absolutely. Flesh. It's, a, it's a very noble thing. So that's how you do it in, in an organization like that. It's, it's very personal and it's very, uh, you know, it's very local. Right. Well, I'm sorry you couldn't join us afterwards. I mean, we really wanted to see you, of course, as we always do. But you did have very important things to do. 
Uh, we went to the Hustler Club and did a bump out of a stripper's belly button, uh, which I know you would have enjoyed. But that may or may not make it into the show. <laughs> with your wife. <laughs> right. Oh, she's, she can bump with the best of them, baby. The, philanthrop- uh, the philanthropic piece of that story is one that has really funded symphonies around the country for a long time. And I don't tend to be, you know, I'm not a trickle-down guy. Uh, I just, I don't believe in the data, but here's where it absolutely does work out and where I am happy that people like Alfred P. Sloan made a jillion dollars because his foundation, 40 years after his passing, is still funding things that are important to the arts, if not the most newly entertaining or novel pieces that people are, you know, striving to grab at. Cole, however, has managed to figure out how to make something that's consumable by the masses today that is, you know, that converts into a few bucks. And so a tip of the cap, Cole, for for being able to touch a nerve that way, Uh, because really what you're doing is is something very similar to uh, I mean, like you've you've said something very similar to the thing that Dr. Bob does, which is allow us to understand and appreciate and enjoy music a little more. But you got Spotify to pay you a few bucks to to do that. Yeah. My story is pretty unique, though. That's not very, that's not how it's not a recipe. (laughs) It's not a recipe. It's a a home run. You ran into a fastball. It was a lot of luck. I mean, I put my, in my, myself in a position to have luck, but yeah, there's, you still have to swing the bat there. to run into a fastball. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the funding thing's interesting because people are willing to pay for quality and you see that now, or at least I see it now. Like if you guys are familiar with Patreon, mm-hmm. which is providing creators of all kinds of, a livelihood. I mean, I was using Patreon before Spotify came around and then <clears throat> given a couple more seasons, I probably could have got to a place where I could have done it full time. But you know, there's, there's intellectuals that are just giving lectures that have podcasts that are making, you know, tens of thousand dollars a month simply through Patreon. And podcasts are kind of the, the space where I think a lot of that, the intellectual presenta- presentations are being able to, to play out. Um, which I, which is why I really love the podcasting medium because people are going to this, this space to consume long form, deep dive, intellectual, you know, really heady, heady stuff. If you look at the top podcast list, it's like Ted talks and Joe Rogan, who's, you know, pretty fascinating guy. It's, it's all these like people that are just interested in learning and, and having meaningful conversations and they're willing to pay for it, whether they're, supporting the person on Patreon or as someone in my position, like pe- what I love about podcasting is that it's creating this community that is really based on learning and, 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 and pursuing like intellectual discussions. Like people listening, even to listen to this, it's like, they're going to listen to an hour and a half, two hour converse conversation. That's it. Yeah. But, um, and there wasn't really a medium before that. And that's what's, really fascinating about your work uh, with the great courses is that was it was kind of a podcast before podcasts were a thing it was downloadable on demand you know you had to pay for it up front but um you know now you can do it for free with just through advertising i mean actually since i have you have you ever considered doing a podcast i would do it in half a heartbeat if i um <clears throat> if i felt that i could um you know i vlog it's not yeah. quite a podcast yeah, yeah. but um and I do blog every week. Yeah. You know, I write an 1,100 word piece every week, as you guys know, the Music History Monday. But, you know, I, I should be doing that, shouldn't I? Yes. You can even just read those blog posts yeah. out loud. Even you see a lot of people in journalism now on websites, you'll have the story, but then you can click play on an audio of the same piece. And essentially, you can turn what are you're already doing into a podcast and even. We get more more listeners and potentially monetize it if you're interested. Well, let me ask you some questions because we're going to do a little business here. Yeah, right. <laughs> when Jack created Patreon, I was I met him. Do you know Jack? I do. Oh, okay, I do. Is we he from around to, here? We have yet to have Jack on the show. He's a super guy. Well, we've been trying to hunt him down. We had Natalie on the show, and she's amazing. But Jack, a visionary, and yeah, a Jerry. very a very nice guy, and and I'll. 
off air, we'll talk about contact info, because I can share that with you if you want to. Mm -hmm. And I signed up early and never used it. Mm. Because the question I want to ask you, because this is where my roadblock came, is, you know, you need to offer your donors some sort of extra something above mm -hmm. and beyond. What did you offer your your subscribers? Well, I'll say... Pictures of himself with his shirt off. Yeah, <laughs> because everyone wants to see that. <laughs> well, 120 pounds of me. Um, no, well, one, I would say you don't actually have to do anything if you don't want. You You would be surprised the people want to pay you because they appreciate what you're already doing. You'd be surprised how many people, like I for one, would 100% do it. I support people on Patreon personally that don't offer me any extra content or if, I, if they do, I don't even pay attention to it. I just feel good. I think people just feel good about supporting the things that they really, really enjoy. Um, but, you know, I did do a few things. Um, most of the community, I would say, is all you would really need to do. People want to feel a little bit more involved in um, you personally. So I did Patreon Q and A's. So they would just write their questions for me. And then I would film a video answering their questions. So pretty simple things, but I think they really were appreciated because yeah, they get to ask me directly things that they were always curious about. We did, I did some merchandise, some pins and fun things like that. And like just little here, things here and there, but I honestly didn't do all that much because it's, it's just a lot of work. You know how right. to even just do one extra episode for them would just be a lot of work. So I think you can get creative with it and find ways where um, you're in. I think it's more about interacting rather than just providing more content. If you're already providing the content, they appreciate that. That's why they support you. Now it's Patreon's a great way to actually start to directly involve them. I, I want to jump in and, and illustrate to a point. You said it's a lot of work. That really isn't good enough because someone two years, three years, five years, 10 years from now can hear that and think, oh, well, he was just lazy. No, no, no. It's like it's hours and hours and hours and hours. And if you're going to get $150 back, not that that's great, but it's hard to justify 20 hours of work. And that's and I don't know how long it takes you to do an episode. It takes us 10, yeah. you know. So, I mean, it's just a lot of it is a lot of work, but it's more than just a lot of work. It's you can't justify that amount of work for for a small amount of money you should put your money and effort into something else potentially well and it depends on where you get with the patreon if that's going to be your you know your the way you get income, income then stream, obviously yeah. you're going to give it more of your time but if it's kind of a supplementary thing it's yeah i think it's pretty flexible in how what you want to do if people don't sure. want aren't happy with what they're getting in return they can stop at any time that's the great right. part like i never felt an obligation because I was pretty upfront of like, here's what you're going to get. You can support it or not. I mean, my Patreon's down now because of Spotify. But had I continued on the path that I was going, you know, it was a really cool, cool thing. And I think, especially with the, someone like you with the built-in audience already, I think it could be, it could be. You know, I, I, and we won't talk business much longer, but first to address what Pete said, this is the problem of being self-employed, yeah. is that you, you can never say no. You can never say too much work. Because you never know what it might lead to, yeah. right? You know, so so cold busted, but but look what it led to. It's right. Because you created quality and consistent quality, and it meant that, in your case, a rare case, admittedly, but you know we are all hoping for the for the for the ring at the end. You were rewarded, and you are being rewarded for your hard and good work, mm. and that would never have happened had you not blindly invested the time. Sure. Up front. Yep. And the same thing is true with me. You know, what, what brought me to the attention of Tom Rollins, who founded the great courses of the teaching company, was these endless adult education courses I taught mm. four nights a week. And that was after teaching four days a week. Wow. And then I, all weekend prepping. And I had two small kids and I had no life of my own. And, uh, and yet my reward was something I could never have anticipated. Yeah. Right. This guy calling me one day in 1992 and saying, you're it. You know, with a guy. You know, and so if you're self-employed, it just means constantly taking risks and constantly spending more money and spending yeah. less time with your kids yeah. and less time out and less time exercising and not, not living your life because you're always trying to... But if you don't do that, you're never in control of your life. Right, yeah. You know, and so... I, I, so back to what you're talking about, I would it would be very easy, for example, for me now to to podcast to mm -hmm. to record my music history Mondays. 
I have to say those vlogs that I've started doing, they were all, the great courses asked me to do all of that to increase my sales. Mm. But I'm not seeing $10,000 a month increase in sales. Yeah. Um, am I using my time wisely enough? This is something I'm right. constantly asking myself. Yeah. Because I'm, in, you know, now that you can buy my courses from my website. Yeah, that's great. For download. It's great, but how do you get out there? Yeah. And if people are used to getting everything for free, well, why should we? Yeah. You know, I mean, so yeah. I have to supply something extra, but that supplying something extra is another day's work. Well, let me say this in your behalf, then, because you do the Alexander Dream Quartet sessions here in San Francisco, but right. you also do in Phoenix a similar thing. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't, if you're in those two cities and you don't go consume this, you're just fucking crazy. Because watching that for the amount of money, and it's very reasonable. Pete's talking to you, listener. Yeah, absolutely. If you live in the San Francisco Bay Area yeah. or in the greater Phoenix area and you're not consuming these lectures, this content that Dr. Bob is bringing you're with the help crazy. of brilliant musicians, you, you're World really, class really musicians. missing out. Yeah, yeah Phoenix Symphony. Now, these lectures I do in Phoenix, they're self-standing, but they're in conjunction with the Phoenix Symphony. Sure. Okay. First-rate organization. And yeah. the, the, the place where I do the lectures is one of the most amazing places in the world. And did I tell you guys about this place? Yeah. You, well, you started to yeah. off mic before. Yeah, the Musical Instrument Museum. Who would know that, the, that one of the greatest musical instrument museums in existence is in Phoenix? It's Phoenix. Is in Phoenix. Mm. The Target. The yeah. guy who founded Target. Built this museum and installed this collection, and it's it's crazy <laughs> fantastic. Pete, that might be where we interview George Benson. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I would love to get George Benson. Let's go do it. Let's go to Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. You mean like from Breezen, George Benson? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've already got him to say yes. It's just been a matter of getting him and us in the same room. Wow. We did Breezen. I was in a... a, a, a Maybe Mr. Benson shouldn't hear this, <laughs> but I was in the in the like everyone else in the mid seventies. I was in a uh, in a disco band, right? Yes. And we wore matching leisure suits, <laughs> a freaking bit. My I still have, for a photo. I still have the shirt downstairs, the silk shirt. It fits well. No, it would fit him. <laughs> I weighed 145 pounds back then. Now, yeah. at, at 195, it's going to go over like one shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Breezen was, yeah, no matter what kind of band you had, you had to play Breezen. You just had to play it. Everyone wanted to hear Breezen. Yeah. Dunk the gugga I as a drummer, here's what drummers struggle with, Breezen. Do I play those sixteenth notes with my with one hand on the hi hat? Or do I or do I two hand it? Because it changes the way you approach the whole song. Uh, hmm. and the answer to that question is you play it with one hand. But that's you know, every beginning drummer who's exposed to Breezen has to has to deal with that before they can move on. You know what? This has been a tremendous week for for Pete and for me. We've been fans of Cole's show from the very beginning, so we watched the show take off into the stratosphere and the launch of season three and Frank Ocean, which, you know, is enormous. We've gotten to hang out with Dr. Bob and see his lecture work. And we were earlier this we actually, that was the end of last week, we were at Roland for their Totally Drums mm -hmm. event, the launch of their new version of the V Drums, and there were a lot of drummers in the house and... Along with a lot of drummers, just a lot of rolling artists. So I had the uh, pleasure of seeing Rick Morata again, who I, who I love. So I always enjoy running into him. But this week I also met Jimmy Jam mm. and Ray Parker Jr. Everybody knows Ray Parker Jr. for Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. People don't realize, that, uh, I should say, only those who know realize that he's a monster on the guitar and a tremendous jazz player and a tremendous everything player. So this week, it's Sunday now, and you guys are closing up what, what has been a huge week for me to have the privilege of putting the two, two of you together, yeah. first of all. And then to hear your perspectives on these topics, uh, each of you, thank you very much for that. And I want to ask Cole first, what would you like to see Dr. Bob, as a consumer of Dr. Bob's material, what would you like to see him do in the next year or two? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Um, I got a question for you too, Dr. Bob, but 
Cole goes first. No, I mean, well, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is totally selfish, but it's kind of that's what the question is. So, yeah. what would I do with Doctor Rob the robot? I mean, it'd be cool to it would be cool to one day hear uh, your um, like an analysis of contemporary work. That would be kind of what I would be curious about. Whether that's and maybe outside of classical um, or art music would be interesting for me. But obviously, I'm very skewed bias towards that subject but i just think it'd be cool to hear your mind kind of you know analyze. wrap around some contemporary yeah work. i think that'd be really interesting i think i would disappoint the living daylight out of uh, yeah. yeah i do i do listen I, I i've listened to your show and i've i've listened to your interview with these guys the whole world of sampling of of of, of the layering techniques mm. and this kind of this is utterly foreign to me yeah. And you know, you need, the first thing you need to know before you do a freaking thing, before you say a freaking word about anything, you've got to know the repertoire. Yeah. You've just got to know what's out there. You've got to know who's who, mm -hmm. who's making what choices, how the technology allows them to do this. You got to have all the, the chain of influence. You got to have the technical chops mm -hmm. and you have to know the repertoire. I have neither. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would merely be reacting yeah. based on what I know in my world and I would be reacting out of ignorance yeah. and not out of strength. And I, I try at my age now, when I was young and stupid, I put myself in all sorts of positions I shouldn't have been in. But at 64, I have learned to keep my trap shut when I'm in a place that I don't know about. Oh, that's... What's a famous line? Is it, it's, it's better to be quiet and thought an idiot than to open your mouth and prove it. Yeah. <laughs> Remove all that. Exactly. Right. But, exactly. but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back now because that's what I do. And I'm going to say this. If you were to take Warren Zevon's last album that he made while he had cancer or David Bowie's last album when he had cancer, you know that. You know that muse. You know that kind of music. And you could go in and do what you do and blow our minds. And I have – you may not have it, but I have every bit of faith that you could take those works – and give us something that was David worth a Bowie. Lot of money. I, I, I probably could. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but we're talking about the world of hip hop, contemporary the world music. Of electronics. This no, is two I, years ago. It's contemporary. It yeah, would count. I, it is. But there's, there's. I, I stand in awe of what's being done technologically. Sure. For sure. Um, in terms yeah. of, in terms of this, it's, it's utterly foreign to me. Now, what I, I heard you the, say was you're going to do the, David Bowie. Well, I, I would be willing to listen and try. That's All what right. Angie Bowie heard Mick Jagger say, too. <laughs> anyway. Okay, back to the belly button. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, dude. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that comment and the humility behind that comment, but I think what Cole's after and, and what would fascinate me as well about that idea, the notion that you would take apart something contemporary, it isn't necessarily the technical piece as much or the you know the instrumentation and the and the technique behind the production but the uh the parts that you do know which is the history and humanity and emotion that goes into a piece well, of now here's here is the circumstance under which i would do such a thing i would do such a thing in order to find links to the music i know mm. for example igor stravinsky used to talk about his works as assemblages he didn't call them compositions. He, he says, I make assemblages. And he would, would create these, these little blocks of sound that could be superimposed, juxtaposed, all kinds of things. Now, that's a process not unlike what we're talking about now. Edgar Varese, uh, who in the late 40s and early 50s started using this Ampex tape machine to create something called music concrete. That is, he'd record sounds. And then he'd splice and dice and superimpose and create these extraordinary soundscapes. I would, if I had to do this, if I'm, uh, for example, if we're working with the kind of hip hop we're talking that, that, that I've heard on your show, mm -hmm. what I would do is try to put that within the context <clears throat> of the music with which I am familiar and give it a historical context. Because whether these electronic people today know it or not, they're doing stuff that's been done before. You under, did it yesterday. Under other circumstances. When you're talking about Dimitri's music, because we go way back, me and Dimitri. But he was sampling. You said, like, here is Moonlight Sonata. Yeah. Oh, that's piece. right. Yes. He was sampling. And you absolutely could compare and contrast those so, techniques. So that, that's something I could do. And that's something I would do, providing that everyone understood that I was not 
saying that I know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. and that I'm not declaring myself an expert on this music, yeah. which obviously I'm not. So as, as long as we went in with those understandings, mm -hmm. then I'd be okay with that because it would be an interesting exercise. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, you have to respect expertise. You have to respect the people who spend their lives thinking about this music and listening to it. And I do respect it. And I know where my limits are. And I think it's important for all of us. Yeah. You know, we don't want to superimpose limits on ourselves that, that don't exist, but we never want to be jerks either. And I have to say, there's a, I've, I've, we've, all, we've all run into a lot of jerks who think they know, because they know one thing, they think they know everything. <laughs> and yeah. it ain't the fact, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and that brings me to the topic of Cole Kuchner. Dr. Bob, seeing uh, the effect of... Cole's work and the response that he gets and the amount of passion that people have answered Cole's work uh, with what do you think is the uh, logical path that Cole should take the uh, more desirous literate listener this episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. The person who wants to who wants to appreciate, understand, and further enjoy music and sees Cole as their pathway to that. Uh, what do you think? Because I think those listeners are listening to this show. What do you think it is that you'd like for them to uh, to look for in music as their tastes mature? I think what Cole said before about what I was able to offer him mm -hmm. is as far as we need go listen what, don't you love being talked about in third person yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's actually, sitting right it, here it, man it's, it's actually a Jewish tense it's called third person invisible you know, yeah. <laughs> would someone tell your brother if he doesn't finish his broccoli he's gonna wear it that's third person invisible yeah. that's third and fourth because yeah. you're asking for someone no it's third person invisible my mother was a master of that she was also master of first person command <laughs> You'll pass the ketchup. <laughs> not, not, not please. Not the, you'll pass me the ketchup. She once did this, by the way. Wow. My, my elder kids, who are now 32 and 29, were, were, were little ones, you know, four and five, whatever, whatever their ages were. And uh, she says, you'll pass the ketchup. I said, Mom, what's the magic word? Because I'm thinking, you know, they, they need to learn. I say, Mom, what's the magic word? And she looks at me and she says... Now. <laughs> wow. Wow. And you got to pass it, didn't you? Tough chick, yeah, tough chick. Anyway, anyway. Um, I think I'm asking you to highlight Cole's responsibility to the universe well, now Cole that he's taken no, up this mantle. Cole has no responsibility to the universe uh, up and beyond what, he's already, what you're already doing. And that is dealing with the music you love and dealing with the musicians who you respect and and opening them up to kind of divine influence and allowing, mm. allowing other listeners to hear them with, with new ears and, and increased comprehending. Um, if you continue on this path, sooner or later, as, as your vocabulary widens and as your interests grow, because that's what always happens, yeah. you know, yeah. we, we, just, we just, okay, stuff that used to satisfy me. I mean, my background is, is as a jazz pianist. Mm. And... Um, that's how I made a living for a long time. I mean, it's not that I didn't play my Bach and Beethoven and Mozart when I was a kid, but, you know, when I was a teenager and a young adult, I made my living playing jazz piano. He's just uh, trying to distract us so we don't demand no, no, that no, he show I'm, us that leisure suit. Well, <laughs> oh yeah, I'll show, I'll show you a picture. <laughs> and, and I'm a good jazz pianist, but, and I was even working in New York. It stopped satisfying mm. me. You know, I got to a point where I just... It's a hard world, first of all. Yeah. It's a very yeah, hard world. Yeah, you said world. that. And it was a hard world when I was doing it in the, in the, uh, the mid-70s. And more and more, I was attracted to composing and to the world of art music. Yeah. It's, and this becomes an inevitable thing. None of us can stand still. None of us stand still. We all need to grow all the time. So you'll find your growth direction. It's inevitable. And wherever that direction is, 
you're a good teacher, you're going to draw people with you. And that's all we have to do. That's all, our only responsibility is to be honest with ourselves, yeah. talk about what we love, and, and, and teach well. You know, show that love, show that enthusiasm, yeah. and bring it to the people who are listening to it. And that, so I have no advice except keep doing exactly what you're doing. Yeah, I think the well, you said honesty, and that's like really where I found because I did I tried a number of things in my life and tried to be successful at them. Most of them failures, um, which you know is a pretty common thread with all successful people. I feel like um, and everybody at this table. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like once I got to a place of honesty where I was doing things not to get attention, that's when the actual real attention came. Mm -hmm. I think part of all successful people is they, yeah, they find this place where they are doing honest work. They're doing true work, authentic work, where it is mostly about the work itself and not the things that come with it. Um, so I appreciate that sentiment for sure. And um, yeah, I mean, I feel comfortable going forward knowing that that's kind of my North star right. is the honesty and just staying true to myself and presenting the work with honesty if it flops, it flops, but it's, you know, that's, that's the great part about doing things with authenticity and honesty as your primary uh, motivation, because whatever you put into the world, it's, there's no failure, you know, at that point, it's, it's all with, it's the process, the, the, the authenticity of the process is the success to me at least. So knowing that now, like I'm pretty comfortable going forward. And what you also have going for you, and this is important for all of us, you know, when we're 20, we all want to be a success or 21 yeah. or 22. But you know what? It's not our time. You still you still have to accumulate life experience. Yeah. You still have to yeah. fail. Yeah. You still have to learn what your priorities are. OK, but by your mid 30s, you're a dad, you're a husband. Yeah. You got real life responsibilities. The whole world starts to change. We, yeah. we, and people will accept yesterday at this donor gathering. I was asked to describe next year's program for our Saturday mornings. Oh, just you wait, listeners. And I was, and I was just, well, okay, Robert Schumann was a habitual masturbator, and we know that from his diaries. And I made some bad joke about hairy palms. Now, all these rich people laughed heartily. If I had tried that joke when I was 30, <laughs> right. I, it would have fallen dead. But you see, I've got cred now. I've got street cred because I've been doing what I'm doing long enough and they expect a certain sassiness from me and we were in a private setting. And the same is true with you. You've got your cred now. You, you've built it up over time. That's the other thing we get with age and with time. The longer we do something, yeah. the better we get at it, the more credible we become. And it's what you were talking about, authenticity. Yeah. Authenticity only comes with failure and experience. Yeah. That's it. Competence cannot be taught. You learn it yourself over time. You guys, you saw what I think about you yeah. as, as we interviewers, as you. podcast people, beyond competent, okay? Total competent. But that, didn't, that doesn't happen by itself. It only happens with life and experience. And that's one of the really glorious things about getting older. Our knees go, our hair goes, our eyes go. But if we're smart, we become wiser and all the time more competent. And licensed to beat off a lot. Uh, you and Robert Schumann, let me see your palms. Oh my God. <laughs> so hairy. Oh the my hairy. God. I see shaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get five o'clock shadow. David Mamet, I believe, said uh, that the keys, there were three keys to, to success in storytelling, and that was, sh or to, to an actor, uh, show up on time, hit your mark, tell the truth. And so I think those things and we've said that on this show a number of times uh i think it was jay moore who mm -hmm. yeah told us that rep that reference to begin with and it's been our mantra this whole time but i want to uh end our show on this point because i think this is the most important thing that that really embodies the torch that that would be passed if this is a, a passing of a torch from literate classical Quit trying Art to yank the torch out of Dr. Bob's hand. No, I'm not <laughs> yanking the torch. It's, but it's, it's sharing yeah. of the torch. But, but, yeah, the, torch. the reality is that torches. you've... you've <laughs> it's lighting right, more torches. Exactly. Yeah. You've, it's like the Olympic torch. You've passed it by relighting and lighting it into a different uh, type of music that, like you mentioned, uh, Cole, 
understands the chops of and 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 it is that so i think that's the essence that everybody should get out of this show is the the quality the consistency and again show up on time hit your mark tell the truth pete yeah, this is what I want to say. Uh, first, I'm going to say, say one thing to Cole, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, I love what you're doing. Please keep doing it. You're doing the right thing. I know you know all those things, but just I just have to tell you that because I only listen to so many podcasts because I have to do all the production stuff that we do for ours, and there's yeah. just only so many times. So the moment something from you comes out, it's on the docket, and I'm going to, I'm going to listen to it. And, and that, if that doesn't resonate as being a big compliment, it's a really big compliment because my yeah. time is just so constricted. So yeah. I love what you're doing. And you're giving me a whole new form of music that I didn't really have the ability to understand. And because you teach it in the vein of Dr. Bob, it really makes it accessible to me. And if that works for me, there's a whole bunch of other middle-aged white dudes that want to know about Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. And so you've, you've given He's us that. He's teaching it as Cole Kushner. For you sure. In, but, but, like, but, but I learned from Joe Kermit. For sure. Yeah. You know, I learned from Joe. And so we, in, just, in, we pass it on. I was going to bring up Joe Kermit, too. I mean, for you, I wanted to ask you this. If... You know, this is like Leipzig back in the old days or Prague where, you know, Mozart mm-hmm. and, and Haydn get together or, you know, one of the box is training, you know, somebody else. What is that moment like here in Oakland where you have younger generation people doing similar things to what you do? What, what do you see? You know, I wish I could speak to it more intelligently, but because I, I, I live in my own little cloistered bubble, mm-hmm. I, I, I can't speak to that. You know, when I hear John talk about growing up in Vallejo and it being this hotbed, this, this right, like, like Vienna in the 1780s, with all this talent in yeah. one place, bouncing off each other, learning from each other with this, this learning curve that's just almost vertical. That's very exciting, but unfortunately, that's not my world. So I, I can't speak to it. But one of the joys of the Bay Area, and I think that this is true, is that you have so many talented people living in one place, learning from each other all the time. So I can't speak specifically to what you're saying, but it's certainly going on. What I'm saying is this. Let me make it, try again, because I did a terrible job of explaining it. If Cole is Mozart and you're Haydn... <laughs> I want, right? to, I want to be Mozart. Yeah. Okay. If you're Mozart and, and Cole which one is those two, <laughs> Cole which one Beethoven, those two beat no, off a lot. Beethoven. <laughs> if you're Beethoven, and I don't know who's next in line, but this is like one of those moments where you have two people that are doing incredible things that many years down the line can quite possibly be talked about. This could be one of those moments. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Well, it would be nice to feel that way. Listen, I, I just think it's great that you've created a vocabulary of genuine... And I, one of the things I asked Cole about before we started recording was, is there a book in this? Yeah. You know, where, where not just your techniques, but your ideas about what's going on. I mean, this is really important. Once you can document things and talk about them and learn to talk about them in a certain way, the, the influence you could have is tremendous. And, and much as I respect podcasts, you know, until there's some kind of hard copy, yeah. um, it can't be, we distill stuff when we make hard copy. Yeah. We have to distill it and refine it and, and sharpen its edges so that everything is clear as it can possibly be. But this is as it should be, and this is how it's always been. You know, each generation makes its mark and then passes on to the next generation. What I think is wonderful is that, is that you're creating vocabulary based on art music that can now be used for any music, mm. and it's for someone else to than to create a vocabulary for the music that turns them on the most. But I think this is special, and one of the things that makes it special is the ability to make a podcast. That didn't exist 15 years ago. 15 years ago, you had no way to spread this wisdom unless you were teaching in a classroom, and then the only people who got it were the kids sitting in front of you. Yeah, Yeah. And they barely wanted to be there a lot and of times. And they barely wanted to freaking be there. <laughs> yeah. Don't you know it? I mean, yeah. it's one reason why I left the conservatory. And they just got their asses threatened by the 26-year-old bass drum player. Yeah, so right. The, uh, <laughs> this is the furthering of human society, fellas. It really is because I know I make, I make jokes about it, but what's happening here is that uh, Cole's ability to propagate this sentiment towards the, the enjoyment and the appreciation of the music is... Uh, to some degree a result of opportunity and technology meeting Mm -hmm. so here we are we're right here at the precipice of being able to uh, plant a seed in 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 listeners that they didn't necessarily have access to before and we don't know what we're going to inspire 
So uh, I wanted to thank you both for, for coming on the show. Uh, as always, Dr. Bob, thank you for plying us with martinis. <laughs> it's my greatest pleasure. <laughs> and, the charcuterie uh, is yours, my friend. Yes. And Cole, uh, you know, man, we're, you were huge admirers. Keep up the good work. We're looking forward to whatever it is you churn out in the three times pace that you're uh, able to keep <laughs> yeah, up yeah. now uh, as compared to before. You know, as you know, I just am concluding my career as a uh, private investigator. But I, I'll tell you, the, the first two seasons of Dissect, I would spend on active stakeouts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching a window and waiting for something good to happen while I'm hearing about Kendrick Lamar. That's so, so interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's cool. It, it, it is really cool. So, anyway, thank you both. Uh, Dissect podcast on Spotify. Get it. Subscribe to it. Robert Greenberg music. Be there. Consume everything. Music history Mondays. All of that stuff. I'm John LG sixty nine on Twitter. I'm at Pete A Turner on Twitter right now. Actually. And, right now and we are both at break it down show so reach out to any and all of us and i hope you guys uh, reach out to our two guests today to get the education on music and appreciation of art and history that you uh, all deserve to to enhance your experience thanks everybody thank you thank you, thank you guys thank you thank you